John 10. Um, we're up to verse 22. And um, really verse 22, even though it's happening on a, on a, at a completely different time, it follows on from what's gone on before. Um, what's gone on before was the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's really interesting that it culminates in chapter 10 with the Feast of Tabernacles because in the parable of, or the, the picture that the Lord uses of himself as the good shepherd, taking Jewish sheep out of the Jewish fold, and then also drawing Gentile sheep and making them one flock, it really ties into tabernacles. Um, tabernacles had a special application for Gentiles. If you go to Zechariah 14 in the millennium, mm. it actually says that the tabernacles will be the one feast that Gentile presence will be required. And if um, mm. a country doesn't send a, a contingent, a representative body, they will have no rain on them. So it's, it's for Gentiles. And throughout the seven days of sacrificing, 70 bulls would be offered. And mm. 70 has special application for Gentiles mm. because of Deuteronomy 32, um, verse, I think it's verse 8, which um, says, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of men, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. And in Exodus 1, it tells us the number of the sons of Israel in verse, in five. verse 5. All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were 70 in number so 70 sons of israel and in genesis 10 we have 14 nations coming from japheth 30 nations coming from ham and 26 nations coming from shem which equals 70. so we got 70 gentile nations and you remember when um, they went to Elam, the, the Israelites went to Elam and they, um, they camped there. And in, in Exodus mm. 15, in verse 27, they came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water, springs of water representing springs of salvation, 12 representing the tribes of Israel and 70 date palms. So there's such a picture there of the gospel is from the Jew, but God chose Israel to be a source of blessing for all nations. It's a picture. Mm. So God, so it is with chapter 10 of um, John's gospel that out of the Jewish fold, God takes a remnant out. This fits in with Romans mm. 9 as well. So there's a remnant and they are what, Romans 9 calls true Israel, their spiritual Israel. Mm. And then we Gentiles who believe are grafted in among them into yeah. their spiritual yeah. covenant, into their spiritual body, into their covenant. It, so all the blessings that we have in Christ are mediated through this remnant of Israel. So much so that Romans chapter 15 tells us in verse verse 27 that these gentile believers from macedonia and achaia made a contribution to the jewish believers who were poor in jerusalem and it says yes verse 27 they were pleased to do so and they are indebted to them for if mm -hmm. the gentiles have shared in their spiritual things they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. So our equality mm -hmm. with them in Messiah and in salvation doesn't mean that there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. 
in, in any mm. sense. We, we recognize that it's their covenant, their blessings. The, the gospel came from them, uh, but we have been brought in together with them to make one flock, not two different flocks, one flock. So we're up to verse 22, and um, we're going into a different feast called the Feast of the Dedication. So could someone read verses 22 to verse 23? At that time, the Feast of the Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So, dedication in Hebrew is the word Chanukah. So, Chanukah comes from the word Chanukh, which means to dedicate. It's the same name, Enoch. You know, the Enoch that walked with God, his name means dedicate or dedicated. Mm. So, what happened in about 164 BC, as you know, um, the Syrian... Um, branch of the Greek Empire that split up um, under Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, basically turned against Israel when he was um, he was dealt a blow by the Romans. The Romans turned up in Egypt and sent him home with his tail between his legs, and he decided to take it out on the Jews. And he made it legal to keep the the Shabbat to circumcise their kids. And there was a priest called Matthias who was taken to a high place and was told to slaughter a sacrifice to a god. Um, he refused. Another Jew stepped in to do it for him. And um, they, him and his sons, they basically turned against him. They killed the priest and then they went into hiding. So they, in a sense, they went into the wilderness. And um, they were joined by a group called the Hasidim. And the Hasidim were pious Jews who were faithful to the law. They would go to other Jews and compel them to keep, pass, um, to keep um, circumcision, to keep Shabbat, and to keep the Jewish laws. Um, so what happened is event they started fighting against the Syrian Greek army that was, was against them. And then eventually they captured the temple. And in the around about December time in a, a month called Kislev, they sanctified the altar because the altar had been desecrated. They, they, they des Antiochus Epiphanes had a pig slaughtered on the altar. Um, there was a pagan statue put up and the temple was defiled. So Hanukkah speaks about taking something that's been defiled and rededicating it to God, pulling down the old altar and rebuilding a new altar. And it was the, 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 the dedication of that altar that is commemorated in this feast. Now, this feast ties in with the Feast of Tabernacles because they rededicated that temple after the pattern set by the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's because in the old two temples, the altar was dedicated to the Lord at the Feast of Tabernacles. So can someone read 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verses 1 to 3? This is um, Solomon's temple. So 2 Chronicles chapter 5 verses 1 to 3. Thus all the work that Solomon performed for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated, even the silver and the gold and all the utensils, and put them in the treasuries of the house of God. Then Solomon assembled to Jerusalem the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the father's households, or the sons of Israel, to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David with the Zion. Men of Israel assembled themselves to the king of the city. That is in the seventh month. So they assembled for the feast in the seventh month. That's the month that tabernacles occurs in. And if you turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, and can you read verses 8 and 9? 
So Solomon observed the feast at that time for seven days and all Israel with him, a very great assembly who came from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt. On the eighth day, they held a solemn assembly for the dedication of the altar. They observed seven days and the feast seven days. So you've got the, that's the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a seven day feast, but then the eighth day is a, a Sabbath day. So it, it really is it, like eight days, even though the feast is for seven days. Um, so that's when they dedicated the altar. The same thing happened with Ezra's time when the, the, the altar was built, when the exiles went back to um, Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Um, can someone read Ezra chapter three, verses one to seven? Now when the seventh month came and the sons of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Yeshua, the son of Zadak, and his brothers, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brothers arose, built the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And so they set up the altar on its foundation, for they were terrified because of the peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. And they celebrated the Feast of Booths, as it is written, and offered the fixed number of burnt offerings daily, according to the ordinance, as each day required. And afterward, there was a continual burnt offering, also for the new moons and for all the fixed festivals of the Lord that were consecrated, and from everyone who offered a free will offering to the Lord. And from the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. Then they gave money to the masons and the carpenters, and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and to the Tyrians to bring cedar wood from Lebanon to the sea at Joppa, according to the permission they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. So Cyrus was the one who... Um... He gave the first edict that allowed Jews to basically leave their exile and go back to Israel and to basically have their temple. So from going out into exile and coming back, the primary thing is to build up God's house. That, that was the first thing that they had to do. What's interesting is with... Um, with the Feast of um, Dedication, you had another group of people that went exiled. They went and hidden. They went and hid in places outside, and then they come back in and they dedicate the temple. And they dedicate the temple or the, the altar really over eight days. And what to do that? They had to light a menorah for eight days, but the 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 story goes that they only had flask of oil for one night but miraculously the oil lasted all eight nights and that's why the feast of Hanukkah is also called the feast of lights not anything to do with Hinduism it's recognizing this um, special um, miracle that God did and so they were able to dedicate the altar because of God's intervention because God supplied the oil because God made the light keep burning they didn't have the capability to do that and so you know um uh, some people um have a problem with christmas um i don't really do christmas or birthdays um but i don't i'm not legalistic about it i don't judge anybody but some people really do have a problem with christmas and i always think well if you're not going to celebrate something there like you're not going to celebrate christmas hanukkah might be a good thing to celebrate because i kind of feel like if you don't if you if you don't do christmas you don't do birthdays and you don't do easting you don't do this and this and this well god actually told israel 
that they had to celebrate feasts in Jerusalem and they had to be happy. There was only one feast they didn't, they weren't happy and that was the Day of Atonement. They didn't eat. But every other feast is basically, Jewish people summarize it like this. They tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. And it's just joy and merriment and God wants his people to celebrate. And so hear the Lord, this is a feast that God never commanded in the Torah or even in the Old Testament. There was no commandment to do Hanukkah, but here is the Lord doing that. The only thing for parents though, <laughs> is it could be quite an expensive feast to do because it's eight days of presents for your kids. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so that's an expensive one. Don't tell them. Yeah. <laughs> but um you know th this is a celebration that you know something that is defiled the temple that was defiled by pagan um symbols and mm. pagan offerings mm. slaughtering a pig on the altar they could go in they could take down that altar and rebuild an altar and rededicate that temple to the lord so god can take something unclean and bring in his light and bring a cleansing and make that temple that was defiled become holy. And so that's a real picture for us. Um, that's what the Lord can do in our lives. And, and by doing that, it means we are dedicated to the Lord as his temple. Um, we are holy. Um, it's interesting as well that this happens in winter time. It's around December. Um, just as a side note, not to do with this passage, but it's to do with the pattern of exile around about this time. Matthew 24 actually says when, in verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, then whoever is in Judea must flee. Whoever's on the housetop, whoever's in um, the field, don't go back. And then it says in verse 20, but pray that your flight will not be in the winter or in the Sabbath. I wonder if there's a recapitulation of this um, mm. whole thing. Well, it must be because it's the abomination of desolation, but the whole thing of winter as well. Mm. Um, it yeah. mentions it's winter and it mentions this takes place at Jerusalem, which possibly indicates that the Lord from the Feast of Tabernacles actually went back to Galilee and now is back in Jerusalem because otherwise, why would it mention Jerusalem? And, um, mm. and it mentions it's winter to tell us why he was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon, because you had a raw east wind that would have come through. And so it's cold. And this is Northern hemisphere, not Southern hemisphere. Um, mm. Can someone read verse 24? The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in the drink? If you are the Christ, tell us something. So, you, some people, I was reading, some people would translate this. Um, basically, why do you kill us with delay? But the idea that's being communicated is, this is driving us crazy. Just tell us what we really want to know. And the circling around, which it literally says they circled him. So they not letting him go anywhere. They want an answer. What is interesting is all the way through Jesus' ministry, he was revealing that he was the Messiah. I mean, all his miracles, if you break down the meaning of the signs, they all testify to his greatness, his, his um, superiority of Moses, mm. his superiority of the law. Everything was pointing to the fact that he came from the Father, and yet they can't see, like, they, they just want a quick answer. Mm. But if they really were interested in what the Lord was teaching, they would have seen it. Mm. And so they want the quick answer without having to really you know get that revelation from everything he's taught they're just saying give us the it's almost like a, a, a tell us what the right answer is that kind of mentality just the quick answer that we don't have to think about it and that's the problem is that unless you 
really commit yourself to Jesus teaching, you'll never really see who he is. And that's what he says in verses 25 to verse 29. Can someone read verses 25 to 29? To, to verse 30, sorry. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name. These testify of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So the Lord says to them, I told you, and you do not believe. And then he points to his works. The works I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. So the, uh, in other words, unless you're concerned about his message and, and understanding what his miracles meant, and really embracing what he had to say, you're not going to hear it. You're not going to believe. Um, he actually said, you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that um, we're not talking about the chosen frozen here. You know, like there's a few people that Jesus wants saved and then the rest he doesn't want saved. Because what does he do later? He actually appeals to them. He actually says to them, um, if you don't believe me, believe in verse, um, um, where is it? He actually says, um, if, if you don't, 38. yeah, in verse 38, if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is me and I am the Father. So Jesus is wanting them to come to a place of belief, but they're not of his sheep. And what does it mean that they're not of a sheep? Verse 27 tells us what the nature of a sheep is. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So they're people who take Jesus' words really seriously and commit themselves to them. So if they would be interested in the message and really want to take the message on board, then through that message, they would come to understand their need of salvation. How do we know this? Because this is all built on John 3, um, verses 19 to 21. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world. Tabernacles, I am the light of the world. Also Hanukkah, festival of lights. Light comes into the world. And men love darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So there are a group of people who are sheep who hear Jesus' voice and they follow. And Jesus knows them. He's known them from the beginning, the foundation of the world. Because the God that we serve is... He's not bound by the constraints of time. Past, present, and future is all one to, one to him. So from before time existed, he knew those who are his. But um, his sheep are the ones who hear his voice and they follow. And as long as they weren't interested in his word and only wanting that quick answer, they're not going to see it. So he actually says as well, not just that, but verse 28 says, I give eternal life to them. So eternal life is, is a result of someone turning and, and hearing and following the word. And um, by putting their trust in Jesus, they get eternal life. There are some people who teach that you get eternal life first, you're born again first, and then you believe. But I believe John teaches the, it the other way around. Mm. You believe first and then you get eternal life. Um, these things are written that you may believe and in believing you may have life in his name. Um, and he also says, no one will snatch them out of my hand. If you go to John 6, John 6 verse 40. 
It says, this is the will of my father, that everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Um, Jesus mm. here presents a once saved, always saved scenario of those who are the sheep who believe, and believing is present tense continuous. Um, as you'll mm. see later when we get to John 15, um, that presents a different picture. It's not a once saved, always saved picture there. It's only those who abide that, re that remain abiding in the vine. They're the ones that remain. Mm. And the ones who don't abide are cut off and thrown away. And so the, the, the struggle that I've had previously has been, well, isn't that a contradiction? And the way I've kind of come to a peace with the mystery of it, that there's complete security in Christ, but the security in Christ is for those who believe and continue believing. Um, they are once saved, mm. always saved. Yeah. There are other people who I believe are not once saved, always saved. But Jesus' sheep, they're the ones that hear and follow, that are foreknown before the creation of the world. They, no one steals them out of Jesus' hands. They, they don't perish, and Jesus raises them up on the last day. So there's this eternal security that's in Christ. Um, how do I have eternal security? Not by holding to a doctrine of once saved, always saved. It can't, because... Here's the problem with that, um, trying to get a security from that doctrine. Like I know somebody who in South Africa, he believed the gospel. There was fruit in his life. He served the Lord. He was a minister of the, of the God's word. He, um, and I, I knew him over years. Today, um, I don't know if he's changed his mind, but the last time I met him, he said, I don't need Jesus to go to heaven. Yeah. I mean, he completely turned like, and, and I tried to, in the first I tried to convince him and then I saw I wasn't going to convince him. So I tried to understand what happened. And to this day, I don't understand what happened. Yeah. And so when you kind of look at it, he believed the same thing I believed and he really did believe it. He had spiritual fruit in his life when I knew him. So, so if you were once saved, always saved, you have to say, well, he was never saved to begin with. Mm. And um, mm. then, but you're saying, but everything I've experienced in salvation, he experienced. Mm. So you have to argue, well, then maybe he deceived himself and he wasn't really saved. And that, in itself brings you to a place where you can't have security in your salvation because maybe I'm deceived. Maybe I re I think I'm saved and I'm not really saved. Mm -hmm. Salvation that that security and salvation cannot come from a doctrine of once mm -hmm. saved always saved. Um, the the only security we can have is in Jesus Himself. Exactly. So I mm -hmm. put my faith in Him today to keep me forever. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I'm 100% secure in him. No one can snatch me out of his hand. Um, scripture says that there's nothing in heaven on earth or under the earth that's able to separate us from the love of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so the best way to remain secure is to keep abiding in him Amen. and to put your trust in him, not in your, not in your own ability to keep yourself, but in his ability to keep you. Yeah. And so... He says, my father who's given them to me is greater than all. That also gives us security. Oh, Lord, what if, what if the, the trials that come in the future are too great for me? Well, my father is greater than those trials. Mm. He's greater than all. Mm. He's greater than the enemy. He's greater than the communist regimes that have persecuted Christians. He's greater than Islam. And he can keep them. And Jesus says, no one's able to steal them out of the Father's hand. And then he says, I and the Father are one. Which for the Jewish people is a problem. Um, can someone read verse 31 to verse 38? 
The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered him, I showed you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered him, Has it not been written in your law? I said, You are gods. He called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him, whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, You are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand Father is in me and I am the Father. So by saying I and the Father are one, he's basically claiming to be God. Because every, every day um, in the Siddur, in the Jewish prayer book, um, they recite the Shema, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And so this is for their ears, blasphemy. Um, and so they pick up stones to stone him. Now this is significant because Jewish people at this time did not have the right under Roman law to execute anybody. Mm. Mm. which tells me that they are livid mm. and they're not thinking clearly. Mm. They're reacting emotionally. Mm. The Lord hit a nerve. Mm. And so the Lord, what does he do? He points to his works and his works are not simply evidences of power. They are messages in and of themselves. Mm. And he's wondering mm. which work did I do? contradicts the idea that I and the Father are one. Mm. And they don't, they don't even go there. We're not going to um, stone you for a good work, but for blasphemy, because you're a man, but you make yourself out to be God. Notice Jesus doesn't have a problem with them calling him God. If you go to John chapter 20... And verse, can someone read verses um, 24 to 28? But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the door having been shut, and stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger, and see my hand, and reach here your hand, and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Verse 29. Ah, sorry. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. So look at Thomas. Thomas says, Look at what he says. It says, He answered and said to him, to Jesus. The words that he says are directed to Jesus, not to the Father. He doesn't turn around and say, my Lord and my God, up to heaven. Mm -hmm. He says, my Lord and my God, to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Jesus' response to that is, because you see me, have you believed? Now, it's one thing for him to say, my Lord, but to say, my God, mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. personal God. Mm -hmm. God says, you'll have no other God except for me. Mm -hmm. And the Lord has no problem with him saying those words. Contrast that with the angel in Revelation chapter 22, in verses 8 and 9. 22, 22 verses 8 and 9. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, 
I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. So the angel is freaked out by John's worship of him. Mm. Yeah. He's like, I'm not God, therefore you do not worship me. I'm mm. just a servant. So the only person that would accept worship without being God would be Satan. Mm. Yeah. But right. Jesus, he accepts worship, yeah. which indicates that he is God. <clears throat> um, there's no, I don't think there's a way around John chapter 20 it's not just a respectful title mm -hmm. so my sir my lord is in you know someone who's superior it's also my god mm -hmm. so the jewish people understood jesus correctly he's claiming to be god mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. they, they jesus answered to them and he says has it not been written in your law i said you are gods that's taken from psalm 82 and we should go there. Psalm 82. And we can understand that from the, we can understand the context of these words if we read from verse 1. And I'll just read it because I'll comment as I go through. God takes his stand in his own congregation he judges in the midst of the rulers or the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked Selah? So these are rulers who judge God's people. And in verse 3, he says, Vindicate the weak and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. I don't think these are spiritual gods like spiritual beings like that i don't believe they're angelic beings i believe they're human judges because why is god calling upon te uh, like territorial spirits to bring justice to the widows and the they they don't they don't render those judgments it's the people the elders who sit in the gates they're the ones that do it and, it, and as we read, it says, they do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men. How can God be saying that to angelic beings? You will die like men. This is <clears throat> human rulers. You will fall like any one of the princes. And then it says, Arise, O God, judge the earth. These are earthly rulers, for it is you who possesses all the nations. So there is a group of rulers here that are called gods. Gods doesn't mean that they had the power to speak reality into existence. It doesn't mean that they were semi-divine beings. What it means is, they were elevated by God to be rulers under him over the people. And that's how the term gods was applied to them. Can you go to Exodus chapter 4, verse 16? Exodus 4. And this is Moses turning around saying, I can't. I can't speak, don't send me. And God gets annoyed with him and says, well, there's Aaron, your brother, the, Le um, the Levite, he speaks fluently. So God's going to use Aaron as the mouthpiece. And can someone read verse 16? And he shall be your spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to you instead of a mouth and you shall be to him instead of a God. Yeah, and my translation, it says, he will be as a mouth for you, basically as a prophet, and you will be as God to him. 
So this is this idea of God is not meaning a divine being. There is only one God. There is no, there's no other God. But these are people who are under God, wielding God's authority over other people. They're not speaking things into existence. They're not um, king's kids who have this power of faith. Um, not one of them did anything like that. And the Pharisees of Jesus' day didn't speak things into reality either. What Jesus does here is he does a remez. A remez is a clue, a hint. He quotes half the verse. He says to them, has it not been written in your law, I said you are gods? It also applies to the Pharisees because they're also in a position <clears throat> of ruling over God's people. And what he's done is he's quoted half a verse to hint at the other half of the verse. I said you are gods, but nevertheless you will die like men. There's mm. judgment coming. But the Lord focuses on the first part, you are gods. And it says in verse 35, if he called them gods to whom the word of the Lord, the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God. This argument is what's called kal vechomer. Kal vechomer means, it means easy and substantial. Light and substantial. The word chomer means substance. So the idea is, one is a, a light situation, uh, and the other is more hectic situation, or a more important situation. And so, if they are called gods, how, and they have authority given by God invested on them, then if they can't regard Jesus as, as, as the son of God, there's a problem because Jesus came directly from the father, which means he has to be God in a greater way than those guys were. He, they had received authority Jesus himself came directly from the Father, mm -hmm. i.e., he's got to be divine. He's got to be God. They can't have a problem with that. He's mm -hmm. the Son of God. He's not just a Son of God. He is the Son of God. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to, to kind of reject that is basically to contradict the idea that he's come from the Father and to treat him as a normal human being. And he's already always maintained that, that he's not from this world. He's from somewhere else. He's from the Father. And then verse 37, he knows that they'll find that very hard to believe. So again, he appeals to them. He says, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. If my works don't have the Father's voice in them, communicating the Father's message in them, don't listen to me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is me and I am the Father. Because those works show his superiority to anything that they had under Moses. That's what we read right at the beginning in John chapter 1. It says in verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. He is the prophet like Moses, and he is greater than Moses. Do you think it convinces them? Nope. Verse 38, can someone read verses 38 to verse 42? Oh, sorry, verse 39 to verse 42. Therefore they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no signs, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. So it doesn't convince them. They're still trying to kill him. Mm. They still try to grab hold of him mm. and the Lord hides from them. Mm. It's almost like that verse in Hosea, I will go to my place and God will hide himself from them 
until they acknowledge their guilt. Um, Isaiah, I think um, Isaiah speaks about that in Isaiah chapter, I think it's chapter 8 and verse 17. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will even look eagerly for him. And the, and the, when God reveals his face, it will be to people who will trust him and him alone. And you read that in chapter 10 of Isaiah and verse 20. They have to accept Jesus as Messiah um, for him to reveal himself from heaven to them. He goes away. This, this picture here of him eluding them and hiding away from them is very much the same kind of thing of, uh, as Jesus going up to heaven. Mm-hmm. And he says, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So there's a picture here of that. that um, when they try and reject him and try and seize him, he hides from them. Um, but verse 40 and 42 to 42 is really instructive because this is the crux of the issue. You can't get to Jesus except you come through John first. You can't mm. embrace and believe in Jesus until you come to terms with John's message, which is exposing sin. And that's the thing, uh, you know, he's, he said in um, chapter 10, Um, And verse 3 and 4, he who enters the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, that's John the Baptist, and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. You can't bypass John. John, his message, you know, is first. And that's why the Bible says the Lord is the schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. That unless we have real conviction of sin and see ourselves Mm. before God's holy standard, we'll never accept salvation. We'll never believe in Jesus because Jesus didn't come for good people. He came for people who know that they are sinners and they need God's grace. And so I just um, Mm. think that John 10 just brings this culmination of, like these last seven, like chapter seven to chapter 10, it's all leading up to this, that, um, you know, they, when they came to John the Baptist to be baptized, they weren't coming like the rest of the Israelites did who came to John, really acknowledging yeah. their guilt. They just thought, well, we're children of Abraham and we can get baptized as well and add it to our spiritual CV. But um, to really come to John, you have to realize there's nothing I can boast in. There's nothing I can claim. Mm. Everything that's good about me is dung before God. Mm. And um, therefore, I have to flee the wrath to come. That's what John said to the Pharisees mm. of the day. Mm. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Mm. Um, God was looking for a repentant people, a people that knew their own spiritual poverty and were throwing themselves upon the mercy of God. Mm. That's the place, you know, John performed no sign, but uh, and so the, the signs don't change anybody's heart, no. um, but they heard John's voice. Mm. And in hearing yeah. John's voice, they heard the voice of the father mm. and the voice of the son, mm. and many believed in him there. Mm. 